This program is brought to you in association with First National Bank of Botswana. Hardly three years ago, our lives were completely different from what they are today because of the pandemic. People learned to shop online, even for groceries. Delivery service providers were thriving and Zoom meetings became one of the most used virtual meeting platforms in the entire world. Fast forward to today, offices are fully staffed operating as they were pre-pandemic. This is in spite of the fact that working from home has been proven to be cost effective, saving companies, businesses and organizations thousands on operational costs such as on electricity, on rent, water, etc. In fact, it is not just the employer that benefited from this, but the employees as well. With no commute to the office, workers are saving money in many different ways. For example, those working from home are saving a lot on fuel, tyres, oil changes and other maintenance. And that's just on that car alone. This is not just with regards to working from home, but rather a bigger issue of a culture of coming up with innovative solutions and failing to commit to them long term. It can regard abiding by workplace ethos a culture of having regular staff check-in meetings or anything that tries to maximize input for optimal output for the benefit of all involved. Where are we missing the mark? With a background in innovation at the workplace, we have here Stencil Technologies Chief Operations Officer Mulibi Mapanyan. Malibi, thank you so much for coming on First Issues and affording us your time. We are talking today about committing to innovative solutions or committing to new ways of doing things. And the pandemic showed us that we really needed to switch to newer ways of living and newer ways even of how we worked, where we saw um, a lot of companies allowing staff to work from home. We saw a lot of virtual meetings, right? And... These solutions proved to not only be efficient, but they were also very cost effective. But unfortunately now, most of these organizations, if not all of them, have now wanted staff to come back to work full time from the office. So even after it has been proven that these newer solutions are working, we are now resorting back to the old way of living full throttle. Where is the disconnect? For me, I think there's there's a there's a couple of you know elements that we need to be aware of. Um, the first is not all industries sort of had the same experience with those uh, efficiencies. It's definitely more cost effective to have people work from home or for people to have the option to work from home. It saves you on office space. It saves you on fuel. It saves you on a number of things. Um, but for some organisations, um, the 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 focus in the workplace is less on outputs and deliverables and more on seeing the person. So that had a number of effects. And some companies are still uh, recovering from this. Back to back to back um, online meetings just to make sure that somebody's working. Uh, tracking software on devices to see whether or not uh, the person is engaged at their laptop for eight hours a day. So these caused certain problems. And uh, I think sometimes it's based on the mindset of the, uh, the knowledge worker versus you know, the, the production worker. Um, the knowledge worker is being mined for their skills and what they know, um, not necessarily their time available under your eye. And so this is a change that we need to make in our workplace culture that says, I'm gonna hold you to a deliverable uh, over a certain period of time. And if you don't do that, you're no longer my employee uh, versus I'm going to look at you and if you're sitting there, um, you're, you, you're getting paid. So that cultural shift would make, go a great way to allowing us to innovate and be able to do things with, with greater efficiency. Those are very 
valid points that you make, but one could also argue that this is a classic case of leaders failing to implement change management strategies within their organizations, right? So what do leaders then need to consider as key components when trying to introduce change or dealing with change within that places of employment? Uh, one of my favorite quotes is, keep the main thing the main thing. So you have to decide what it is that you want to, what you want to achieve. Uh, that's your primary mandate or, or what your strategy calls for. And then you need to be able to communicate what change needs to happen in your organization that will allow or, or force from without, like COVID, right? That was a change from without that your organization needs to go through in order to achieve, achieve those, those, uh, those outcomes, those deliverables, that mandate. And that needs to be clearly communicated to everyone that has to go through that change, either developing skills, retraining, or anything like that, that allows them to go through that change. So if you can communicate the benefits of this change clearly to somebody and to your entire organization, then that's what will actually be the catalyst for change. And it needs to be um, an entire organization that, is, that understands what it is that they're trying to do and will be willing to be uncomfortable during the period of disruption before the period of adoption. So a period of disruption, things are uncomfortable, you're less, um, you're less productive, things aren't great. But when you reach the period of adoption of the change, then everything smooths out and there's a new status quo. So to answer your question more succinctly, ultimately communicate the benefits of organization or, or, or cultural change um, and, and, and continue to do that throughout the entire period so they know what the difficulty they're going through is for, what the benefits will be. Well, that being the case that leaders sometimes fail to manage change, it was also some leaders who, who found it befitting that staff return to the office full time, right? My question to you then is, what circumstances would warrant that an effectual strategy be revised back to an older, perhaps even archaic one? When there's a resistance to change, uh, it comes from one of three things. The first is, uh, I don't understand why, right? And that means that either the person or people or organization um, or, or what is it? I don't, under get, I don't get this. I don't understand it. The people or the organization or the leaders themselves uh, have not fully grasped what's, what change is required or what the benefits of the change are. So that's a communication problem. Uh, the second one is um, I don't like this, right? And that's generally a fear response to change. Um, and that, that usually takes place if the environment does not allow for a period of disruption or experimentation, uh, you can look at it as disruption or experimentation, where mistakes may be made, but you'll come out the other side better. So if, you, if your targets are short term and you're judged short term, you're not going to be willing to, to go through change. You're going to fear it, right? And if your environment is not safe in order to, to experiment, in order to get it right, then you're going to say, I fear this. Uh, the third one is, uh, I don't like you, right? And that means there is a personality conflict when it comes to the messenger or the, the person or even the, the external factor that is causing the change. So nobody liked COVID, right? So you can actually try to ignore the fact that things have changed and say, you know what, COVID was the worst. I'm going to actually ignore everything that it's done to the world. But unfortunately, neither of these three things can be allowed to persist because the change is coming from outside or sometimes from inside and expectations have changed. So, you know, you need to acknowledge which of these three it is and either learn more, negotiate your terms better, or learn to like the external change. At the end of the day, the issue is learning to commit to something new in spite or despite the discomfort or the fear that might be experienced 
Right. So how can junior officers, um, senior managers, leaders, anywhere or anybody really um, develop a habit or that habit that would help them commit to new solutions, to new ways of doing things? You know, to go back to the idea of really understanding what the benefits of change are, of, of the change or disruption are that, are that are coming into your life. You, if you have a key understanding of what it is that you stand to benefit, what the organization stands to benefit, and you repeat that throughout the period of disruption, you will be able to sustain change. But more so than that, you need to track the benefits, or sometimes even the failures, and communicate those. And then celebrate your wins. Celebrate the small wins so that you know Right, we're trying to achieve this. This is what we did. It was great. Celebrate that onto the next step. And each nudge towards that period of full adoption should really be looked at and celebrated. But the other thing that's critical is that as human beings, we follow the leader. We don't do Simon Says. It's never, ever, ever, ever worked. So for true change to happen within an organization, the leaders, both official and unofficial, because you know uh, anybody can be a leader in an organization if they don't have, even if they don't have a title. Those leaders have to be brought on board. They have to understand what it is they're trying to achieve, and they need to demonstrate by doing that their change is going to be effective. It can't be assigned to a change manager. It can't be assigned to a digital solutions manager. Uh, it needs to, the, the leader needs to demonstrate and say, hey, look, I'm doing it. You can do it too.